vacation and be able to take an attendant with me. Without the attendant services, you can't live. Uh, it's something you need for survival. I don't want to be provided for. I'm really fed up with that role. The direct individualized funding will uh, mean we can move, you can live in a place of your choice. Above all, you can hire the person of your choice, and that's uh, a great freedom, and, and manage the whole thing yourself. Hello, and welcome to DNET, the Disability Network. I'm Bill McQueen. Susan Pettit-Crossman is away this week. On last week's program, we got to know Ian Parker's love of music and how he's independent and able to teach piano in his community because of the attendant services he receives. Parker became disabled as a result of a diving accident in 1974, but he's been determined to make sure he leads as full a life as possible in the community. Today, we'll take a further look at how he and others are fighting to make sure that support systems are responsive to their needs. In February 1993, Ian Parker went to the Ontario Legislative Assembly. Seventy years ago, his great-grandfather, Sir William Mullock, was Chief Justice of Ontario. Ian was there to present a brief on behalf of the Attendant Care Action Coalition, ACAC. He spoke before the province's Social Policy Committee, studying long-term care reform. ACAC was formed almost a decade ago to help persons threatened with the loss of funds. These persons directly receive funding for attendant services through Ontario government, orders and council. The coalition has expanded its mission over the years. They want fuller independence extended to all persons with physical disabilities. ACAC advocates that all persons who wish it should be directly funded to manage their own attendant services. Attendant services you may know or you may not, were set up by community and consumer groups. And it was done deliberately apart from the health system in accordance with independent living principles. We are not using long-term care services. The integrity of attendant services, we believe, will be destroyed if they are forced into a long-term care system. So people all have to come of representing... Ian meets regularly with members of the Attendant Care Action Coalition. Three of those members are Hazel Self, Carol Reback, and Marilyn Well. The choice needs to be out there Absolutely. in the community, and it's been shown already that it works so well. Absolutely. It's uh, been done in other countries, other provinces, and really it's time for Ontario to offer this choice for consumers. It's not for everybody, and we're certainly not... Uh, advocating that it's a choice for those who want it and can manage it. What I want from self-directed attendant services, from from direct individualized funding, is uh, control over my own life. I, I want freedom from somebody else's control, and uh, I want to be able to do it myself. Is that really so revolutionary? Ian, you and I, we share the, a similar housing situation. We share attendance services with 12, 14 other people. And although there's availability of attendance services on a 24-hour basis, it still doesn't meet our needs by any stretch of the imagination. The services are still tied to the building where we live. And the direct individualized funding will uh, mean we can move, you can live in a place of your choice. Above all, you can hire the person of your choice. And that's uh, a great freedom. And, and manage the whole thing yourself. Simple to have a choice. Mm -hmm. And yet, I guess a lot of people don't think of choice as meaning that we have to take greater responsibility. But we are very happy and eager to take that responsibility for our life. I just want to do things myself, for myself. Uh, I don't want to be provided for. I'm really fed up with that role. Uh, that they've been forced into because there just isn't an alternative. But I, I want to do it myself, and I want to be in control of, 
of right. well heck what about being able to move for starters i'm i'm stuck in my building I, i'd like to move a nice neighborhood but my farm is too small i want to be able to go on vacation i haven't had a vacation in 12 years i would like to go on vacation and be able to take an attendant with me or hire somebody wherever it is i travel to um, most people take that sort of thing for granted. I think what's uh, so evident about the things we've been sharing is that it's a, a totally non-health service related uh, service that we require and um, it, it must be kept outside of any health delivery systems or these, these traditional medical models. We're looking for something entirely different to meet our needs. Our needs are entirely different. And the mere fact that we're the ones who know our needs best can completely direct someone to meet those needs liberates us from the, those, that system, and that must be maintained. It allow people, too, to, to develop and maintain their family relationships. Uh, I know that a lot of family people are, um, are reliant on their other family members, and it, it can, while well, well, it's the... It's the a method of choice for many people, it can also for others be really limiting. So, I mean, direct funding would would allow you to have uh, um, a relationship with your family which is uh, interdependent and rather than necessarily um, uh, totally dependent on, on them. You know. And the, I mean, the family is such an important part of what community is about that uh, we, we have to think about the impact this can have on enriching the community. One of the side effects of inadequate attendant services is the pressure that is put on family members. There is often an assumption that families can take care of disabled members without additional resources. Parents, and women especially, bear a lot of this pressure. It's a situation that can lead people to take drastic measures. Susan McDonald is the mother of Matthew, who has autism and cerebral palsy. Even though Susan works, she has little money left to pay for Matthew's attendant. And now I'm in overdraft. Um, there, there's nothing left. I have no money left. During the summer months, the problem is even more critical when Matthew no longer receives support from another attendant at school. Each year, Susan must ask the Ontario Ministry of Community and Social Services for help. Last year, they provided her with only one quarter of what she needed to pay for adequate attendant services. Totally frustrated, Susan made a drastic move. She took Matthew and his attendant to the minister's office and went off to work to make a point. She's going to go to work. Bye, sweetie. Good. The point being, that it's cheaper for governments to provide support for family members at home than it is to place them in institutions. And that with enough support, people like Susan McDonald can continue to work, pay taxes, and make other contributions to the community. At the ministry, it was a familiar story. Things are tight all over. After an hour's wait, Matthew and his attendant were told that the government would review the McDonald's case. Later it was reviewed, and the McDonald's eventually received more than five times the amount they had been receiving. Do you, do you see what's happening here? Susan Pettit-Crossman and Ian Parker spoke with Matthew's school assistant, Michelle Bruce, and Susan McDonald. I need someone to be with Matthew. If Matthew isn't in school, it's a desperate time for me. When he has a, a professional development day, I need to have care for him all day. He can't be left alone. If he has... Um, we're, we're sending him home from school early today. Cardiac arrest, uh oh, that's something, you know, something has to happen where someone can be there for him. If someone phones me from school and says he's sick, oh, okay, then that's another, it's $10 an hour to have someone go into the house to take care of Matthew. Um, spring break, desperate. Um, how, what about exam time? When Matthew isn't writing the regular exams, so he can't, he can't be at school more time. Uh, when school ends in June, it's always a desperate time for parents uh, who have children who are disabled, who need attendant care. In terms of the number of hours that are given to Susan, 
for Matthew. It, obviously, this wasn't sufficient. How, what was happening there? What was wrong? Ten hours a week is not enough. Uh, ten hours a week at seven dollars an hour for for a role in an attendant place, you know, is not nearly enough. Ian, you've been a participant and an activist in the system. What's wrong here? This doesn't make sense. No, it seems that people have to become desperate before system, the big system will react and respond. And there are so many people who need attendant service who are in institutions and, and can't get out and, and aren't, aren't even allowed out. And uh, there are many people with their families uh, who uh, have, have grown up beyond Matthew's age and are becoming adults or who have been adults for quite a few years and can't leave their families because there just aren't the services in the community for them. And, and there seems to be uh, an over-reliance on families. Um, I think that, that we all want families to be supported in, in whatever the family unit is. Um, but so often it seems that there isn't the support there. It's just a sheer reliance on the family to do everything. When a person doesn't have a support group and they're not tuned in or hooked into a system or what's out there that, that can help them, do you think people are falling through the cracks or that institutions are pushing people back into the old way? Absolutely. Uh, sure. And in the effort to to bring about redirection of long-term care, um, of all the kinds of services that uh, many seniors use and uh, many people who are ill use in the community and, and many um, people with just plain disabilities who aren't sick in any way. Um, what's happening is that the professionals and the institutions are still retaining a very big power uh, in this whole movement. And uh, I think there's a real danger that we're just going to see institutionalization of services in the community. And we won't see the kinds of things that, that for us, the independent living movement holds so important. Um, three simple little words of choice, flexibility, and control. One of the problems that I think has been cited is that you have to continually re-qualify for services. And um, maybe, Susan, you can talk a bit about the pitfalls of that. One of the things that I need to do every six months is to apply again for the money that I've been receiving. And um, each time that I apply for this money, I need to say these horrible things on paper about my son again and again and again. Um, it's very depressing for me to even say these things on paper or even think these things. And um, Matthew is not going to become magically uh, undisabled. He, he has been qualified as disabled. Susan, as a woman on your own with a disabled child and needing these sort of services, what would you like to see happen? I would like to see um, people trust um, parents, trust what the parent knows about their child and trust what the parent knows about what they need. One of the major problems that people who need attendant services face when they try to move out into the community is a lack of adequate housing. Waiting lists are long, and many places are not designed to meet the specific needs of prospective residents. One group of families in Ontario decided to take matters into their own hands. Along with others who joined them, they began to develop their own concept of community. A community that would include persons as they are, and not exclude on the basis of difference a community that would be built on neighborliness. Parents of children with disabilities, adults with disabilities, and others joined together over the past five or six years to design four Toronto area co-ops, Cord, Courtyard, Robert Cook, and Rougemont. They call their concept an intentional community, planned well in advance of occupancy. 
These co-ops are unlike most projects which are just buildings and do not consider the variety and diversity of lifestyles of the people who choose to live there. Although Courtyard was the last to be organized, its members are preparing to move in in the very near future. Susan and Ian were joined by two people who have been involved in forming the co-ops. Judith Snow will be moving into Courtyard, while Muriel Sutherland, secretary of Court, became interested in that co-op about four years ago. Basically, CORD is a, a co-op which we are working with and trying to um, involve people with disability into a community um, to give them some form of support to make them a part of. It's more of an integration into a community instead of the isolation that we have. And in terms of the integration, Judith, the, the services that a co-op of this nature would offer versus the other, you know, group homes we've seen, what's this going to do for disabled people that it hasn't done before? For example, one change is that the services are being uh, developed right now before the cooperative housing unit opens. And they're directed towards what will be that person's participation in the community and in the cooperative once they get there. So for example, there's a young man who uh, wants to be part of a kind of a taxi service. And he, his service, his service is going to include having a driver as part of his attendant system so that he can drive people back and forth to the malls and pick up packages and do a messenger kind of service. And what about um, your attendant services and that sort of thing? The, the traditional way was you got so many hours for this much money. This is going to change yeah, in a co-op, is isn't it? Well, in this particular group of co-ops, there's four actually. Uh, the people who are going to require paid services are all getting them on an individualized basis. And the budgets were all prepared beforehand so that when we receive the service dollars, there are already enough for a full service for that person to support their participation. And also they're completely individualized to that person so that they're not having to negotiate with other people about what their service will be. So they're, they're self-directed or... They're self-directed uh, or else directed by advocates if the person is not able to direct it themselves, perhaps by a support circle, for example. I, one of the things that I want to touch on that Judith mentioned is, uh, is meeting the people's needs. And, and if we do that on the broadest way possible, we should start our service by trying to meet people's needs and very much they can then take it from there to involve themselves in whatever they want because we'll be giving people the level uh, of service or, or giving them the funds for them to get their own service to the level that allows them to participate fully in the, in the broadest sense in, in the community. With Quad Corp, you really have to want to be there, to be supportive, to be part of an integrated community and know what it's about. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the difference I see there too, which is very strong which we don't have now. Based on that, uh, this model versus your previous experience, sorry, previous experience, what was your previous experience like with this sort of thing? Well, actually, when I talk about previous, I talk about um, home and that meaning where I'm from, culturally speaking, um, wherein I did not see that segregation strongly in terms of people with disability being institutionalized. There was the, the family support, the neighbors support, the friends support. So all the thing, people remain in their homes. And when I came to Canada, it was more of a shock to me, wherein mm -hmm. because you had a disability or you were labeled, I mean, it was obvious because of where you were put sort of thing and when I heard about core this is really what um, triggered my interest very strongly I wanted to be part of where everybody felt like somebody you know one could make a contribution it's looking beyond the limitation and seeing that person as an individual with skills yes having having a need but also having those needs met by the community and not so much by an institution in store for the future of long-term care? That's a question that's been examined by many committees. It's also the topic of many reports, including this one titled Independence and Control. One of its contributors is John Lord. Ian met with Lord and Audrey King, who uses attendant services at her apartment in Toronto. So the, re <clears throat> the review of support services 
that you did in 1988 before long-term care was an issue. I mean, it broke some ground. Where's that gone? I think one thing that it did was, was for the first time probably build some consensus amongst the consumer service provider and government about, you know, a different way of doing business. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think in some respects it was a catalyst for some continued change, but uh, in other respects it has, you know, sat on the shelf. It certainly is taking a long time to move away from this, uh, as you say, deficit-oriented or pathology-oriented approach to services and move towards what I would call a more empowerment-oriented or strength-based approach to providing support. It's just a whole welfare mentality. And I think when you have disability, you, you also have this, this sort of spread effect where, you know, if the arms and legs don't work, then somehow the, the person is a deficit person. Well, it seems to be a very traditional form of service delivery across all uh, different fields of disability <coughs> and aging. You know, this, this sense that there has to be a kind of a mediating structure. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the community service agency that has to get the funds. And part of it's based on, on traditional ways of thinking, and part of it, I think, is really embedded in not quite trusting the individual as much as we would trust a corporate body so a nonprofit agency would be deemed to be more trustworthy than an individual. Are there models outside um, across Canada or even uh, in other countries <coughs> that um, that we can pick up on and uh, you know that are that are working well? We've just uh, completed some research on uh, on programs in other countries and have noticed that a lot of countries are struggling with the same issues: the United States, Australia, uh, Northern Europe. Um, in Sweden, for example, the cooperative model is quite popular, where the, where the, the, the funds actually would go to a co-op, and then the co-op, <coughs> working with directly with the consumer, would disperse those funds. Again, consumer-driven, but a different sort of intermediate point. Certainly, what I've read about um, Nova Scotia, for instance, they seem to have, in, in a direct funding model, they seem to have so many of the the particulars, uh, what I would think would be would be well done with that is, there was no uh, upper limit placed on, on the amount of service mm -hmm. that a person would receive if they needed it. Mm -hmm. um, the, a person could hire a family member if they if that was appropriate, and it it wasn't uh, income tested or or coming from the mm -hmm. the um, welfare kind of model. There's a pilot project in Manitoba at the moment, the self-managed uh, project which is going through the uh, Independent Living mm -hmm. Resource Centre of, of uh, Winnipeg. And it's quite interesting because they built in some of those features where the consumer, if they want to, can draw upon uh, somebody called a broker who's kind of like a helper, who can help that person figure out maybe a more individualized approach to their lifestyle or maybe could support the consumer to train their attendant if they need to. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's an interesting model that could be developed a little more fully here. Well, you know, I, I think of two things when it comes to long-term care and this business of certification and credibility and stuff like that. One of them is knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And so you have to ask yourself, power for who, where, why, and the limitations of power. And the other quote is one by Jean Vanier, which I just love, which says, help is treacherous because help comes to dominate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, it makes people yet more helpless. Well, I hope, again, just to end on a, on a note of hope and optimism, uh, it's really quite possible and fairly easy to get there. Uh, we have to see the political will and commitment to do it. Thanks for joining us. If you have any thoughts about long-term care, problems or solutions, please write to us. I'm Bill McQueen. Now here's our address. Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. That's Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W, 1E6. For viewers who watch DNet on CBC Network stations, the program will be shown an hour later, starting next week. That means it will be broadcast at 1.30 in the afternoon instead of at 12.30 for most stations. Check your local listings.